what's true and what's right. And the other side fears like the plague, dreads those weapons. It terrifies them. Truth and justice. You should read now their, what they write in the newspapers. They say, uh-oh, we're in for a lot of trouble now. Because in 2002, when we left the West Bank after Operation Defensive Shield, that was like uh, 700 Israeli massacres ago, in 2002, March and April, Israel still controlled the West Bank, so it could control what people saw when they came in. But now Israel says we have a big problem. Hamas controls Gaza, and they're going to give free reign to everyone to see what we've done. They know what they did. They know all their nonsense about human shields. We did everything we could to protect civilians. We only targeted militants. They know it's all nonsense. They knew it. And that's why they didn't allow any reporters into Gaza as they committed their slaughter. And they knew it and know it. And that's why they're terrified now what the world is going to see. The aftermath of their operation cast lead. Cast lead. They're stupid names they come up with. <laughs> Why not just call it what it is? Operation Genghis Khan. You know? <laughs> the writer Herzen, the Russian writer, he once described modern states. He says, modern states, they're basically Genghis Khan with a telegraph. And Israel is basically Genghis Khan with a laptop. That's what that state that satanic state has turned into. Our weapon, stick to the truth. Don't deviate. And try hard, try as hard as you can to control the anger, to control the fury, to control the indignation. And I know it's a hard thing to say, Try hard to be reasonable, to stick by those elementary principles of justice, because that's exactly what Israel fears. It doesn't want the other side to be moderate. It doesn't want the other side to be reasonable. It wants to be able to say, we have no one to negotiate with. We have no one to talk to. And our job is to keep saying, we'll still talk to you. We're still ready to negotiate. You're the obstacle. You're the problem. You're preventing the peace. That's the facts. That's the truth. And I think I remain confident. I'm pretty old-fashioned about these things. If we learn to wield the weapons of truth and justice. And it's not so easy to learn how to wield them. You have to do a lot of hard work. You have to be conscientious. You have to organize. If you learn how to wield those weapons of truth and justice, I still believe that despite all the money that the other side has, and all the power that they have, and despite all their ruthlessness, I still think if we learn how to wield those weapons of truth and justice, and show a little courage, not a lot, we're talking about a little, this is Canada. <laughs> no, 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 I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. 
it's a relatively free society. It is. We should be honest about that. In most of Can in Canada, in the United States, if you speak out, you tell the truth, you know, you may lose your job. I wasn't happy. I lost, wait, 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 let me finish. I wasn't happy. I lost my job. I'm given to self-pity. I save it for my friends. That's why they're my friends. But then a good friend of mine who lives in Aceh province in Indonesia, which is in the pretty place now, he says, Norman, remember, in the bigger scheme of things, what happened to you, it's small change. Here, you speak out, you may lose your job. In most of the world, in places where many of you come from, looking at the audience, you speak out, you lose a body part. You lose your tongue, your nose, your ears. You lose your head, you lose your life. So we're not talking about big sacrifices here. Show a little courage, relatively speaking. Wield, learn to wield those weapons of truth and justice. I think we can win. I do. I'm confident of that. There was a famous labor organizer at the beginning of the 20th century, a guy named Joe Hill. He's very famous. There was a song, I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night. How many of you know it? No one figures. OK. Um, no, you're a new generation. Empty generation, but a new generation. Um, and he was a labor organizer. He was framed on, murder, on a murder charge. He was executed. And his famous last words were, don't mourn, organize. I don't really agree with that entirely. There is a place for mourning. I'm no hero, and I don't say it for all of you say, oh, yes, you are, yes, sir. I'm not. I know that. I know that. I don't have the courage it takes, the courage it took for many of the people of Gaza. I don't have it in me. I know that. Uh, and I love life. I cling to life. I have morbid fear of death. I do. I admit it. And I know when my parents were dying, I clung to their every breath. I would do anything I could to keep them alive for three more seconds. Life is beautiful. Most of us cling to it. 400 children in Gaza, they were snuffed out. Snuffed out for what? Because they don't want to live deprived of food, deprived of medicine, because they have this weird idea that they have a right to live. And their lives were snuffed out. We should mourn their deaths. I mourn their deaths. After a certain point, I couldn't even look at the pictures anymore. I just told my website manager, put it up. I don't even want to see it. So I don't really agree with Joe Hill. There is, as the song, you know, from the Ecclesiastes, there's a time and place for every purpose, and there's a time to mourn. And we should mourn. But after we mourn, then I say, we have to organize, 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 and finally put a stop to that lunatic state. Thank you.